This day, the residents of paradise will be absorbed in their own joys of bliss. Reclining each on a lofty divan, together with his spouse, in shades that please. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا المودة في القربة The first of our salawat in honor of رسول الله محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم The second in honor of Sayyidah Khadija alayhi salam. The third in honor of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. And fourth with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr wa'l-Zaman. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah wa Barakatuh. Fatimah al-Zahra, Salawatullah wa Salaamu Alaiha. Was born in the year 615 and died in the year 11 after Hijrah. Revered in the religion of Islam as the greatest woman in the history of the religion. A lady from whose life many extraordinary lessons may be learnt and many examples may be derived. And a lady who is revered for her sacrifice, for her humility, for her bravery, as well as for her devotion towards the message of the religion of Islam. There is no lady in the history of the religion of Islam who has been seen as a role model in the life of billions of people in the world today like the Lady of Light, to the extent that the Prophet, peace be upon him himself, would say that there are four women who are seen as the mistresses of paradise. Asiya, the wife of Pharaoh, Maryam, the mother of Jesus, Khadija, the wife of the Prophet, and Fatima al-Zahra, salawatullah wa salamu alayha. Unfortunately, however, her biography has not been given the attention that it should be. And therefore, tonight we seek to examine her biography in depth in order that we are able to learn as many lessons from the biography as is possible. As we said, Fatwa Zahra's father is, of course, the Holy Prophet. Her mother is the renowned lady by the name of Khadija bint Khuwailid. <coughs> The Prophet and Khadija share their ancestry in the fifth descendant. Because as we know, Khadija is the daughter of Khuwailid, the son of Asad, the son of Abdul Uzza, the son of Qusay. And the Prophet is Muhammad, son of Abdullah, son of Abdul Muttalib, son of Hashim, son of Abd Manaf, son of Qusay. Therefore, you find on the fifth of the generations, there is a link between the two of them. 
Her family was one of the most revered families in the Islamic State. And the idea that each member of her family held a lofty position. When you look at Fatima's grandfather, you find that Khuwailid, alongside Abdul Muttalib, were the chief patrons of Quraysh society when it came to the protection of the Kaaba. If ever you wanted to know who were the two main people in charge of the Kaaba, one of them was Abdul Muttalib and the other was Khuwailid. Khuwailid's original name was Khalid, of course. But in Arabia, if your name is Khalid, the nickname would be Khuwailid. If your name was Jabir, the nickname would be Juwaybar. Therefore, what you found was that Fatima al Zahra's grandfather, Khuwailid, was the protector of the Kaaba alongside Abdul Muttalib. And that's why when Abraha led his army, when the Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-feel, when they came, the true people who were in charge of the Kaaba were Khuwailid and Abdul Muttalib. You find that another of her famous personalities from her mother's line was her uncle Usaid. Fatima al-Zahra's mother's brother Usaid had a prominent position in Arabian society. They used to call him the just man of the Arabs. Why? Because if you came to Arabian society in the days before the Prophet announced his prophethood, if you came with a set of goods and you wanted to sell them in Arabia, you did not know whether you were going to get your money or not. You see, on many occasions, we dissect Fatima from her dad's side, not from her mom's. You find that this Usaid, the Arabs would revere him as the man of justice. Why? Because alongside the Holy Prophet, they began Hilful Fudul, the League of Justice. The League of Justice was originated because a man from Banu Zabid came towards Arabia, wanted to sell his goods. When he wanted to sell his goods, he realized that these people have taken my goods but are not giving me my money back. The narrations, what do they mention to us? The narrations mention that this man complained on the mountain. He said, oh people of Mecca, I have come as a guest to you. You've taken my goods without honoring my income. This is unjust and this is oppressive. The narrations say there were two men who stood up for this man. One of them was the Prophet, the other was Usaid Khadija's brother. Usaid joined the group and they called it the League of Justice. Helpful for all. In other words, sometimes in English it's translated as the Federation of the Confederates. When a number of the leaders of tribes came together, they formed this League of Justice and they said that this League of Justice will protect the rights of anyone who comes with a business transaction in Arabia. Further than this, Khadija had an uncle, some narrations say a cousin, by the name of Waraqa bin Nawfal. And this Waraqa bin Nawfal, according to narrations, was of the monotheists. There was a group of people who were still following the message of Abraham. And you find that some narrations tell us that Waraka was one of them. He was a cousin of Khadija. And the narrations tell us that he used to be one of the first men who was outspoken against the burial of the female. You know, in Arabian society, the female was buried alive. The Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَإِذَا بُشِّرَ أَحَدَهُمْ بِالْأُنثَى ظَلَّ وَجْهُهُ مُسْوَدَّ وَهُوَ كَظِيمٌ When one of them is given the news of a female, what happens to him? His face darkens with anger and he's in a state of grief. The Arabs used to come forward and say that the female, it's better that we bury her alive. If we have a female baby, we should bury her alive. Why? The first reason is economically, she's not going to be of any use to us. She's not going to stand in the markets with us. She's not going to hold our markets or market stalls. So the first reason was economic. Get the baby, bury her alive. The second reason was what? Second reason was if I have a war with another Arab, this girl's not going to help me. What's she going to do? She's going to raise a sword. They said women will never be able to fight. It's better we bury them alive from a young age. 
Number three, this daughter of mine may embarrass me, but she may run off with the son of a tribe member I don't like. So it's better that I bury her alive. You find Waraqa bin Nawfal, Khadija's cousin, would stand up in front of the Arabs and he would say, Oh, people of Arabia, if it is money that you look for, I don't mind paying you. But please stop burying these females alive. This is unjust and this is barbaric. In other words, Fatima al Zahra, from her mother's side, her uncle, her grandfather, her mother's cousin, all of them had a prominent role in Arabian society. And the main aspect was that all of them were monotheists who believed in the oneness of God. And that's why Khadija suffered a setback very early on in her life. Because Khadija, the narration, say to us, her mother Fatima, Fatima al Zahra is named after her grandmother, Khadija's mother Fatima and her father Khuwailid died. The inheritor of the family business was Khadija. Khadija and her sister Hala and her two brothers Awam and Usaid. Khadija, many people today attack the religion of Islam saying women do not have a role in business and that women cannot go out to earn their income. Whereas we find that from the beginning Khadija looked after her family business. When her father Khuwailid died and when her mother Fatima died, the narration say that Khadija looked after her business and she would look after the caravans. In those days, the caravans used to go to places for business. Mecca wasn't conducive for business. Mecca used to have three fairs in the year, but the real business was taking place two places elsewhere. Where? The first business a trade center, people would go in the summer to Syria. And in the winter, they would go to Yemen. In Syria, there would be many products they could buy. In Yemen, they would go for the coffee. That's why until today, the people of Yemen are revered for their coffee. You find the Quran reveals this, and the Quran mentions this, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. لِإِلَافِ قُرَيْشِ إِلَافِهِمْ رَحْلَةَ الشِّتَاءِ وَالصَّيْفِ Quraysh would go where? In the Shita to Yemen. In the winter, they'd go to Yemen. In the Saif, in the summer, they'd go to Syria. These would be the two places they'd go. Khadija would send caravans to these places. Khadija had a servant by the name of Maysara. She said to Maysara, Maysara, I want you to employ someone who can look after my caravans. Maysara said to her, who exactly are you looking for? What type of person? She said, I'm looking for somebody who knows how to travel in the desert in the night and somebody who can be wary of the highway thieves on the way and somebody who has the ability to understand the first aid kit today, what we would call medicine in those days. He said to her, very well, I'm going to go on this journey. If I see anyone with these attributes, I'll tell you. At the time, Abu Talib used to take Rasulullah with him to Syria. You found how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings Khadija and Rasulullah, Fatima Zahra's parents together. Maysara was on a journey, the narration states what? That he found out about Rasulullah's reputation as someone with a fantastic memory, who can glide through the deserts, who is not scared of the highway thieves. Maysara came back, he said to Khadija, I have found a man, and they give him a title, as sadiq and al Amin, the truthful and the trustworthy. She said to him, what's his name? He said, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma sallallahu alayhi wa She said, very well, if he has the trustworthiness and the truthfulness, then why not employ him for our business? At this moment, the narration state that Maysara went to Abu Talib. He said, oh Abu Talib, will you allow your nephew to join our company? Abu Talib said, by all means, Khadija is the daughter of Khuwailid. Khuwailid was a friend of my father, Abdul Muttalib. It's an honor for us to have our nephew join your company. Khadija al-Kubra from the beginning said to Maysara, tell Muhammad, I'll double his commission if he comes back with success. 
no stinginess. Do you agree? From the outset, the idea was that I am a lady of generosity. When they call me Amirat Quraysh, I am the princess of Quraysh. They used to call her Amirat Quraysh. Because not because she had a great business, the generosity that she used to give her workers. Sometimes us, when we have workers, we can be the stingiest people on this earth. Isn't that true? As in we will scrap below. You know how you have the lowest wage? Wallah, we'll try every loophole to go even below, below minimum wage. How can I rinse as much as I can from my worker? The country says this is minimum wage, I'll give him less. You find that this is not Islamic. On the contrary, Khadija, what did she do? Khadija said, tell him, Muhammad, I'll double his commission depending on how well he does. And give me a report about his behavior. Maysara went with Rasulullah. They went, they traded, they came back with double the profits. Maysara came to Khadija. He said, you know, I've seen something I have never seen in my life. She said to him, what is it? He said, it's not the 100% profits that we made. It's not that. He says, I've never seen a human being like this man. She said to him, what do you mean? He said that his memory is unbelievable. When he trades with people, he trades with humility. But there is something that he does I have never seen in another human being living in this whole area. She said, what is it? At this moment he said, when he finishes a transaction, he leaves the market and goes to sit by himself. And he begins to whisper something as if he is meditating between himself and a force on this earth which nobody can know. That I see Muhammad isn't sucked in by the business. Rather the business is a servant of Muhammad. You see sometimes in our businesses, we can be sucked in by the business. Our salah starts getting late. Sometimes our salah goes by the way. You find the way we deal with our family starts being rude. All the Islamic principles start leaving us. Whereas he says, you know, with Muhammad, he leaves. He sits and he speaks to the Lord by himself. As if what he earns, he has to keep saying Alhamdulillah for what he's earned. She said, very well, then tell Muhammad now that he's done this for me in Syria, I'll triple his commission if he does well in Yemen. <laughs> triple. What happened was that he went to Yemen, the success was achieved in Yemen, and he returned. Khadija was telling her friend Nafisa, I have never seen someone like this man. The success he has brought me, the humility he has, the trustworthiness. Nafisa said, Khadija, for how long? Khadija said, what do you mean? He said, for how long are you not going to get married? How many proposals have you had from the Quraysh? And you keep rejecting and rejecting and rejecting. For how many years? Isn't there going to be a stage now that you're in your late 20s? Isn't there going to be a stage now where you're going to come towards the marriage? So Nafisa looked at her and said, can I suggest someone? She said, go ahead. She said, Muhammad. She said, so what do you mean? She said, if he's got the qualities that he's truthful and he's trustworthy, then what are you waiting for? Go ahead. Khadija said, okay, very well, Nafisa, you take the proposal. And what's interesting from this is that that issue of matchmaking was from the time of Rasulullah. In our communities today, sometimes when people hear about matchmaking, they say, what's this matchmaking? Who is this person to bring people together? Do not say, what's matchmaking? Nafisa brought Khadija and Muhammad together. Nafisa went to she went to Rasulullah. She said, Oh, Prophet of God. Or oh, at the time, she would say to him, Oh, Muhammad. She said to him, Oh, Muhammad, I have someone for you for marriage. Would you be interested? He said, Who? She said, Khadija. He said, Khadija for me? Look how great Khadija is. Imagine if Rasulullah says that about someone, then how pure must that human being be? So he said, Look how great Khadija is. Would she accept someone like me? Nafisa said, I know she will. Nafisa told him, go and speak to your uncle Abu Talib. As soon as Abu Talib heard, Abu Talib had a smile on his face like he's never had before. And Abu Talib came towards the Prophet. He said, very well, I'm going to take the proposal to Khadija's house. And to honor this marriage, I'm going to give the cloak of Abdul Muttalib and the staff of Abdul Muttalib. And Muhammad, I want you to wear a black turban. And that black turban is signified today by the grandsons of Rasulullah. And you find that he told him, I want you to wear an agate ring. 
Come, let us go and propose for Khadija. You would think Khadija, because she's wealthy, would ask for a high dowry, isn't it? But someone who knows that contentment in life is better than a high dowry will not ask for a high dowry. Rasulullah would say, the worst of woman is the one who asks for a high dowry. The worst of woman. And the Muslim communities today, do not be surprised. You can hear some stories. I'm telling you, they'll make your bed and hair and everything else go gray. You'll find that with Rasulullah and Khadija, the dowry was 400 gold coins. The marriage was conducted. And of course, they broke all the stereotypes in their marriage. In Arabia, a woman had to be equal with a man in three and greater than him in one. And a man had to be greater than a woman in two. A woman had to be, well, uh, had to be what? Equal in the man with three. As wealthy in terms of equality, in terms of her age equal, in terms of her descent equal. And greater than him in one, in terms of her looks. And the man had to be greater than the woman in the fact that he had to be what? Wealthier than her and taller than her. So what you find with Khadija, Khadija broke the stereotype. She was wealthier than Rasulullah and a couple of years older than Rasulullah. And you found that therefore what happened? That they broke the stereotype. And Abu Talib came and said, in the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful, we are the children of Abraham from the line of Ishaq and from the line of Ismail. And it's my honor to bring Muhammad ibn Abdullah to Khadija bint Khuwaylid. Sometimes people say that this man died as a disbeliever. Only Allah knows what else you need to say in any nikah for people to know that you're a believer. Anyway, so what you found here? Is that they got married and you'd think that when they got married their early years would be easy why because you would think that this is Khadija that's Rasul Allah Allah loves the two of them their early years are going to be the easiest Wallah they had the most difficult early years and there Allah was showing us that sometimes even Muhammad's early years and his marriage are difficult not just you if in your early years you can't have children, then the creation I loved more than any other creation couldn't have children who stayed alive in his early years. Rasulullah has a son Qasim, he dies. He has a son Abdullah, he dies. And could you imagine in those early years when he walks in the streets, especially after he had announced his prophethood and he had been married for a while, people would come and say to him, Abta! Abtar means the one with no line. Imagine, Rasulullah announces his prophethood and he's walking the streets. Al As ibn Wa'il, father of Amr ibn al As, would come and walk in the street and he'd look at him and say, Abtar, where's your children? Do not in your marriages in the early days when there are no children imagine that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is punishing me. Rasulullah was being punished by Allah. No. In life, sometimes we're tested with our wealth, or with our health, or with our education, or with our children. That's an equation in life. There is no one on this earth who will not be tested in one of these four areas. Rasulullah therefore has to wait. He hears these people saying, Abtar, 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 until Allah reverse the verse. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna a'tayna kal kawthar. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Khadija and Rasulullah Fatimah al-Zahra, salawatullah wa salam alayhi. And you find that within the traditions when Fatima was born, Rasulullah would always come and smell her and he would say that when I come to smell Fatima, I remember the smell of Jannah. There is the smell of paradise that comes from Fatima to Zahra, which is an indication that Rasulullah would have gone on a ascension and he would have smelled that smell. And therefore, whenever he'd see Fatima, he would smell her and remember Jannah. You'd find, you know, when Khadija gave birth to Fatima, do you think there were many women who'd come and congratulate her? Today, you may have a baby shower and many women around you. Many women who'd come and say, congratulations, Khadija Til Kubra. None of the women came next to her. They said to her, you marry Muhammad, the imposter, the magician, 
the sorcerer and you expect us to help you when you give birth do you know her house was empty but Allah plans you plan and Allah is the greatest of planner the narration state that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw Khadija with nobody to look after her and normally as a lady you want your sisters you want your mother you want family but when nobody was around Khadija Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the hadiths authentic hadith say that Allah sent Maryam the mother of Jesus and Eve the wife of Adam and Asiya the wife of Pharaoh and Kulthum the sister of Musa to help Khadija give birth to Fatima you find when she gave birth to Fatima to Zahra the narration say to us that she gave birth five years into the prophethood of Rasul Allah in the year 615 and in that year, 615, what do the narration state? They state that when she was born, Fatima the Zahra was born in the most turbulent time for Rasul Allah. Never, ever did Rasul Allah face as much turbulence as in those years. Imagine the young Fatima, after the age of only two, three, you find they've placed economic sanctions on Rasul Allah. The Shaib of Abu Talib. You know in that Sha'ab of Abu Talib, you know what Khadija used to do, Fatima's mother? Fatima's mother in the Sha'ab of Abu Talib. All the money she had gathered from her business, she would spend on at least providing food for the people who were there. There were economic sanctions from the whole of Arabia. Whatever she gathered, she'd provide food. Khadija would not sleep. If Rasul Allah was asleep, Khadija would stay awake to protect Rasul Allah. Khadija would eat from the plant so that Rasul Allah eats whatever is healthy for him. Khadija would come and protect everybody else who was in the Sha'ib. Fatima al Zahra, only a couple years of age, has to see a world where all sanctions are placed on her. That's number one. In that, because of that Sha'ib of Abu Talib, after that Sha'ib of Abu Talib, Khadija picked up a fever. And because of this fever, she passed away. In other words, Fatima al Zahra, the narration say to us, after a few years, she became an orphan. All she had in her life was her father. On top of that, she sees her father doing sujood near the Kaaba. One day, she was sitting there. She was about five, six years of age. Rasul Allah is prostrating near the Kaaba. All of a sudden, Abu Jahl comes with the feces of a camel and pours it on the head of Rasul Allah. And do you know what Fatima would do? She'd say to him, Daddy, do not worry. I'll clean your face. Daddy, I will clean your head. She'd bring a cloth and wipe everything. And she herself would go and wash her hand. And that's why Rasulullah, whenever she'd walk into the room, he'd stand up for her she'd, and he'd say, she is the mother of her father. This lady is a mother for me. Look at the, what she does in her life. Further than that, when her dad would leave the house, we know the verses in the Quran, Tabbat yada abi lahabi wa tab, ma aghna anhu maluhu, wa ma kasab, sayasla naran, that lahab, wa mraatahu hamalat al hatab. The wife of Abu Lahab would get firewood, burn it, and throw it on Rasul. Allah when he's walking in the road and do you know they'd even throw thorns at him and do you know who would come and remove the thorns Fatima al Zahra she'd come with her hands and her hands would have blood because of the thorns she had to pick up and if the fire had burnt her father's cloak she would come and she'd remove the fire that loyalty to Rasul Allah was never equaled by any lady after her and no lady will ever come to equal that and that's why when they eventually wanted to sacrifice and kill Rasul Allah. Rasul Allah said to her, Oh Fatima, I am about to leave Mecca to go to Medina. There is a young man who will sleep in my bed tonight. That man who sleeps in my bed tonight, he will bring you to Medina tomorrow. She said, Who? Oh my father. He said to her, Ali, the son of Abu Talib. She said to him, Okay, very well. Has he accepted to sacrifice his life for you? He said to her, Fatima, he said, Ya Rasul Allah, it's the greatest honor for me to sacrifice my life for you tonight. So he said to her, Fatima, tomorrow, you, Fatima bint Asad, the mother of Ali, and Fatima, the daughter of your uncle Hamza. There were three famous Fatimas in Mecca. 
All you three will come with Ali ibn Abi Talib after he has returned the trusts to the people. I want you to come with him, you will meet me. Where will you meet me? Masjid Qiba. Just before I enter Medina, I'll be waiting. Fatima al-Zahra narrates, I saw the son of Abu Talib take us to Medina. She says, on our way to Medina, the people were chasing us and all of a sudden, all of them were standing and Ali ibn Abi Talib was standing in front of us woman. And they said to him, Ali, give us the woman now. You think her father has escaped? If we allow her father to escape, we'll never allow her to escape. He said to them, and the look was that look which he only gave again once. And that was when Fatima died. And you know what that look was when Fatima died? That was the look when he said to the person who said to him, take Fatima, we will take every single body out of Medina until we take Fatima's body out as well. And he looked at him a look where the person said, when Ali ibn Abi Talib looks at you like that, you do not bother fighting him. And Ali ibn Abi Talib looked at them and he said, do not bother. They bothered fighting him. Fatima says he defended all of us. We reached Masjid Qiba. The companions at Masjid Qiba had told Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, why are you waiting? Medina awaits you. He said, you think I will leave the son of Abu Talib and enter Medina? I am waiting for Ali. By the time Ali ibn Abi Talib reached, his body was full of blood. They had cut him in different parts of his body. But he reached Masjid Qiba. Fatima al-Zahra reached, and this Fatima saw Rasulullah take Ali's hand in Medina. When Rasulullah brought the Muhajirun and the Ansar together in Medina, he brought the Muhajirun, the Ansar, they said to him, Ya Rasulullah, who is your brother? He said, Ali is to me like Aaron is to Moses. Ali is my brother. Fatima having seen all of this, it was only normal that she was going to marry Ali ibn Abi Talib. How? After the Battle of Badr, there were many people who were proposing to Fatima al Zahra. Many. Abu Bakr came and proposed. Rasulullah said no. Omar came to propose. Rasulullah said no. Abdul Rahman bin Auf came to propose. He got a rejection. Abdul Rahman bin Auf then looked at Ali and said, Ali, what are you waiting for? This lady is waiting for you. There is nobody else. Ali ibn Abi Talib with all his shyness, with his humility, he felt that do I have enough to come and propose for Fatima? Eventually the proposal was brought to Rasulullah. Rasulullah said, I will ask Fatima. Fatima, normally she would say no to everybody as a sign of rejection. But with Imam Ali, she remained silent, which was a sign of approval. Rasulullah at that moment said to Imam Ali, what is it that you have to offer as mahar, as dowry? And this is where Fatima got a lesson from her mother Khadija. Because when Imam Ali came, Imam Ali did not have this huge house and fast cars and so on. No. Imam Ali, what did he come with? Imam Ali came and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I have a shield and I have a horse and I have a sword. Nothing else. From the beginning, Ali ibn Abi Talib did not want to say, I have this and I have this and I have this and I have this. At the end, all of these are taken from you. What you say is what you have. Ya Rasulullah, that's all I have. I have nothing more. If it's not enough, then I'm sorry I cannot look after Fatima. Rasulullah, of course, spoke to Fatima to Zahra. And Rasulullah said to him, oh, Ali, as for your horse, keep it so you can use it to irrigate the land as a job for you to have an income. And as for your sword, keep it because that sword will defend the religion of Islam. And as for your shield, it was called Al Hadima. He had got it from the Battle of Badr's booty. He said, As for your shield, sell it. He sold it. He got 480 dinar. From that, you had the Mahar of Fatima. But did Rasulullah, did Ali get married to her straight away? Aqil, Imam Ali's brother, saw him one day. He said, It's been a month now since you've been accepted. What's going on? You know how your big brother talks to you about marriage. What's going on? Why haven't you finished this? Imam Ali said, my big brother Aqil, I'm shy to go to Rasulullah and say to him, when's the wedding? I know he's accepted me, but I don't want to say to him, when's the wedding? I don't want to place a burden on Rasulullah. Aqil said, leave this to me. He went, he saw Um Ayman. Um Ayman, go and tell Um Salama. Um Salama, go and tell Rasulullah. 
When Um Salama told Rasulullah Sallallahu said, on the contrary, let the son of Abu Talib come. Why is he shy of me? I will arrange for the wedding plans. He came to Imam Ali. He said, Ali, what's going on? You want to get married? He said to him, yes. He said, so why haven't you told me? I've accepted you. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I didn't want to put a burden on you. He said, it's not a burden. Tell me. Talk to me. He said, Ya Rasulullah, where do you want to do it? Rasulullah said, you say, is that Al-Haratha bin Nu'man, can we use his house? You see, if you don't have enough at a young age, you don't need to look for the glorious light that young. If you don't have enough, then go for something which is an option. He said, Al-Haratha bin Nu'man, Rasulullah said, you know, we've exhausted Al-Haratha bin Nu'man, but let's use his house. Let's ask Al-Haratha. Al-Haratha, they said to him, Al-Haratha, can we use your house? Because we've used your other houses. He said, Ya Rasulullah, my house doesn't belong to me. It belongs to you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything I earn in this world is a trust from Allah. And you are his prophet. Use my house for marriage. So they used that house. Everybody came in a very simple ceremony. The night before, Fatima al-Zahra, of course, doesn't have a beautiful dress. Fatima al-Zahra was living on the means of her father. So the narration state that her father got her a lovely dress. Like all ladies, they would want a beautiful dress on their wedding day. She's looking at that dress. She's thinking about it. And I tell you today, sometimes we can have tantrums about these dresses. Wallah. You can have headache after headache. Why is the white not brown? Why is the gold not silver? Why is this not that? And you sometimes wonder, are we following Fatima or are we following someone else? Sometimes I forget myself as well. So she's got this beautiful dress and she's looking at it and someone knocks at the door. Comes out, oh family of Rasul Allah, I am someone who is poor and has nothing. And I come to the house of mercy. I beg of you to give me something. Fatima al-Zahra, when she sees this person, she thinks to herself, I'll give the old patched dress that I have. I have an old dress, I'll give it. But then she remembers the verse, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّةِ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You will never achieve righteousness until you're willing to give away that which you love the most. She loves the new dress. And then she came and she said to the person, here is my dress, I only got it now. Go and sell it and inshallah it brings you a good income. Tell me, how many of us live in this world but allow the world to live in us? Wallah, if there is a single mark on that wedding dress, you may have a tantrum where someone's about to hit you. And Fatima says, take my dress. And when they come and ask her, Fatima, why? She said, because the Quran says, you can never achieve righteousness until you're willing. Not you give away. You're willing to give away. That's what you love the most. I love this dress, but I want Allah to see me as someone righteous. And she came that wedding day to Ali. Wallah, she was wearing a dress, patched up dress. They got a patched up dress. The narration said that Rasulullah came hurrying to her. He said, Fatima, get changed. She said to him, why? He said, Jibra'il has just come to me with a dress which Allah has honored from the Jannah. When you give towards Allah, you think Allah will not give back towards you. You find therefore what happened, that they got married. And even when they uh, bought about their house, you see today, unless the apartment, you have to have LCD 46 inch. And the leather sofa, you know those ones which look nice, but they break your back at the end. You know, they call them modern contemporary. Wallah, all it does is break my back at the end, honestly. Just bring me something old, nice cushion and I can sleep on it. Anyway, today, everything's got to be looked after, catered. You have to have the best of this from day one. You look at the person, you're like, my father earned all this in 20 years. You want me to have it in one day? But anyway, the demands are high and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the lesson of Fatima remind us. The narration states, Imam Ali, all he had, wallah, he had a jug and a jar and a mattress and nothing more. A couple of gifts here and there. This couple, who are arguably the greatest couple in Islamic history, that's how they began their marital life. Nothing more, nothing less. 
And indeed, from the beginning, normally today, the honeymoon, you sit down and you're looking on the internet, package deal, package deal, let me find this, let me find that, let me find a hotel, but this is not my... Wallah, you look at some of us, the things we worry about these days, honestly. And you find Fatima Zahra, you know what her honeymoon was? Carrying water for the soldiers at the Battle of Uhud. Face the reality of life sometimes, brothers and sisters. Face the realities. In the Battle of Uhud, she came with 13 other women carrying water. Where are the soldiers of my father? And they'd say to her, you are Fatima. You don't need to serve. No, I am like all the rest of you. Now when Islam is under threat, I roll my sleeves and I pick up water like the rest. And you know how many wounds she treated of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen on that day? 63 wounds on the body of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And here you have this lady who's only been married to him less than a year. And she's patching up the wounds on his body. You see the unison that exists there? And that's why after this, you found that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them with the most beautiful of children. He blessed them with Imam al Hassan, with Imam al Hussein, with Sayyidah Zainab, and eventually with Umm Kulthum. Umm Kulthum being one and a half years of age when her mother died. And this family, not only a sacrifice they would give, their sacrifices were in many ways. When you look for the sacrifice in this world, go no further than the house of Fatima to Zahra. When you look for altruism in this world, look no further than the house of Fatima to Zahra. You find the number of stories from the house of Fatima to Zahra. When it came to altruism, when it came towards sacrifice, and when it came towards never using her tongue to put down her husband. You know this tongue, its weight is so light, its power is so devastating. When you are newly married, the tongue can be very sharp. It can damage the heart of your partner. Be you a male to a female or a female to a male, don't use the tongue sharply. That tongue can be devastating. As many times that you could say, I love you, only once you use it devastatingly, it can destroy it. The number of stories you find in Islamic history where Fatima al Zahra would not want to trouble Amir al Mu'mineen. One day, for example, Amir al Mu'mineen, the narration state that he comes home. He comes home, he enters upon the house of Fatima. When he enters upon the house of Fatima, she says to him, O oh, Amir al Mu'mineen, I beg of you, can you go out and just get me a pomegranate? Because he looked at her, he said, Fatima, you seem ill. She said, I am. He said, why didn't you tell me? If you were ill, why didn't you tell me? She said, I didn't want to trouble you. Because Rasulullah says, whoever, whichever lady makes a demand from her husband, which is beyond his means, Allah will remove her from divine grace. I didn't want to trouble you because my father Rasulullah told me, never trouble Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said to Fatima, it's not trouble. Only one pomegranate and you call it trouble? Please, brothers and sisters, let's put this in our lives. One pomegranate, she felt she was troubling her husband. He said, very well, I'll go out and I'll get. On his way, he bought a pomegranate. The narration states that when he bought this pomegranate, on his way back to the house, he saw this old lady sitting on the ground. She looked at him and she said, oh, son of Abu Talib, I am ill. Do you mind giving me something to eat? He looked at the pomegranate and he thought, but Fatima is ill. But he cut the pomegranate in half and he said, here it is. He went back to Fatima to Zahra. He said, oh Fatima, here is half a pomegranate. She said to him, Jazakallah khairu jaza. He said to her, I'm not going to ask me why. It's half. She said, tell me. He said, on the way back, I saw this old lady who was ill. I cut half for her. She said, Jazakallah khairu jaza. May Allah reward you the best of rewards. That you help the servants of Allah and you help me as well. He looked at her and all of a sudden the door knocked of the house of Al Muhammad. When the door knocked, who was it? It was Salman. Salman came and he said, Oh, fam oh family of the Prophet, I have come to you with a message from Rasulullah. Imam Ali said, What is it? He said, Here are nine pomegranates for the act of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib looked at Salman and said, I don't believe this is from Rasulullah. <laughs> Salman said to him, Why? He said, because Rasulullah says, when you do a good deed, Allah rewards you with 10. Salman said, truly, you're Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he took out the 10th pomegranate. 
The point was the Jazakallah Khair Jaza over a pomegranate. I don't want to trouble you in your life. On another occasion, when he told her, Fatima, why is your face white? I see it pale. She said, I'm all right. He said, no, tell me. She said, we haven't had food in the house. He said to her, Fatima, why didn't you tell me? She said, I never have wanted to trouble you, O oh son of Abu Talib. And do you know this lady when she died? Just before she died, she said, Oh, Amir al muminin remind me, did I ever trouble you in your life? <coughs> he said to her, let me go out and I will go and earn an income. Imam went to borrow some money. He went to borrow one dinar so he could buy some food for the house. On his way, he found Al-Miqdad. Miqdad, salamu alaykum. Alaykum salam, Miqdad walked away. Imam thought, strange. Miqdad never walks away from me. Miqdad, when he says salamu alaykum, would stay and say, how are you? I said, Miqdad, Miqdad, wait, where are you going? Miqdad said, don't worry, oh son of Allah. I said, Miqdad, come back, what is it? He said, Amir al muminin Wallah, I have no money at home and my children's eyes have sunk in their sockets. I have given all my money away to the poor, I have nothing left. Imam said, Miqdad, here, take this dinar. That dinar was meant to be buying food for Imam's house, yes? But this family is the family of sacrifice, isn't it? <laughs> Imam went to the mosque to pray Salat al-Maghrib. Rasulullah is leading. Rasulullah finishes the Salah and he turns around. Where is Ali ibn Abi Talib? They said he's here. He said, Ali, I want a favor from you. What is it, Ya Rasulullah? He said, Ali, I want to come to your house for dinner tonight. I went out to get food for home. I've given my dinar and now my father-in-law who happens just to be the greatest man in this religion wants to come home and eat. So he comes back home, he knocks at the door, Fatima the Zahra opens. Fatima looks at him and you know that look you give your wife when there's a guest who's come for dinner. It's a look of, are you ready for what I'm going to say to you? Fatima, someone's come for dinner. Who? Your father. And the food, she looked at him and said, like, what do we do about the food? He's like, I don't know. The narration states that this lady's connection was with Allah was so pure that in Islamic traditions she went in the kitchen and she called out, Ya Allah, when Jesus son of Mary called you and said, Oh Allah, send us food from Jannah. You sent him down food from Jannah when it said, Rabbana anzil alayna ma'idatan min as sama I am your, the daughter of your prophet. I am Fatima. And I ask you for some food for my father. The narrations, the Ray Jibra'il came down with food for Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. And she was able to feed her father and she was able to feed him more than the Jew. In other words, you found that when the ayah was revealed, that when the Quran revealed the verse and they give away out of their love for the food to an orphan, to a captive, to a prisoner, that wasn't the first time they gave away. They had given every year in their life they were giving. This family of Fatima and Ali, their whole life was giving away towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore you found that Rasulullah at the crucial year before he died, when he had to face the Christians of Najran, who did Rasulullah take with him with the Christians? Rasulullah, when he had to face the Christians in the event of Mubahala, the narrations, what do they say to us? The narrations say to us that Rasulullah took with him as the ayah says, فَمَنْ حَاجَكَ فِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعَلْمِ فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْ نَجْعُوا أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ Say to the Christians, we'll bring our woman, you bring your woman. We'll bring our sons, you bring your sons. We'll bring ourselves, you bring yourselves. I ask you, is a woman allowed to be involved in Islamic politics? Or no? In 21st century Islam, a woman cannot have any political role. In the Islam of Muhammad, a woman was an ambassador in politics. Oh no, no, today's Islam, don't worry. We've made up lots of things in our communities. When he takes her from Mubahala, why doesn't he say, a woman cannot be in politics because she's not mahram to the other man. A woman cannot be in politics because politics is only for men. A woman cannot be in politics because politics you have to have hijab. 
So why take Fatima to meet Christians? Why? Fatima, if a woman is meant to be at home, keep Fatima at home. A woman has as much role in building your community as a man. And unless a woman is allowed to be involved at least in participating in the future of a community, then a community in this Muslim world will never be built. When he went there, Fatima came, Hassan, Hussein, Ali, Rasulullah, all of those who were under the Kisa, all of them came. The Christians looked at all of them and said, we swear by God that we will not enter the Mubahala with these five because the amount of light that shines from their faces, if it told a mountain to move, the mountain would move from its position. The point was Fatima from that day was involved in politics. And that's why when Rasulullah died, what did the narration say to us? When Rasulullah died, the narration say to us that Fatima is Zahra, uh, her father said to her, Oh Fatima, come near me. He gave her a piece of news. He, she first cried, then she smiled. Why did she cry? She cried because he was about to die. Why did she smile? Because he said, you will be the first to join me afterwards. And after Rasulullah died, did Fatima leave Islamic politics? No, she didn't. Fatima Zahra highlighted that Mubahala wasn't a one-off political situation for me. Because when they usurped Fadak, a piece of land Rasulullah gave to Fatima in honor of her mother Khadija. How much Khadija gave from her wealth to Islam? Rasulullah gave Fadak in his lifetime to Fatima Zahra. So that it was a gift. After Rasulullah died, they came and they said, there is no inheritance. They brought out an argument. Prophets don't leave behind inheritance. Fatima Zahra gave two khutbahs of Fadak. And I ask all of you, that if you have not read the khutbah of Fatima Zahra at Fadak, then you should feel a sense of embarrassment if you are a lover of Fatima. In that khutbah, she showed the Quran was part and parcel of her life. She said, you tell me I can't inherit. Sulaiman inherited from Dawood, didn't he? Yahya inherited from Zakaria, didn't he? And all the other verses in the Quran, Surah 4 verse 11, Surah 2 verse 180, verse after verse after verse. Did Fatima say, I can't enter politics, I can't speak out against injustice? Never. I am the daughter of Rasulullah, and when I see injustice politically, I do not stay silent. I have as much role in the political system as every man does in Arabia. And she came out and she spoke, and I tell you, she shattered them. She shattered them. But the man who was in charge of the empire said, Very well, Fatima, I will give you Fedak back. But his friend turned around and said, If you give her Fedak back, then you have to therefore admit that Ghadir also belongs to her husband. And she would speak out, and she would speak out, and she'd speak with the Quran. And you look at the daughters of Fatima today, and I tell them, O oh, daughters of Fatima to Zahra, be walking Qurans on earth. Do not neglect the Quran. Bibi Fadda served Bibi Fatima for how many years? Do you know Bibi Fadda at Karbala? How old was she? 86. From the age of 66 till the age of 86, according to differing narrations, in the last 20 years of her life, Bibi Fadda only spoke in Quran. Do you know what only spoken Quran means or not? It means I never give an answer except using a verse of the Quran because the Quran has everything about life. I can answer you by Quran. Someone says, Sayyid Ammar, that's impossible. I reply, then listen. When one of the companions says, I saw a lady who was stranded in the middle of a desert. I came up to her and I said to her, Excuse me, are you lost? She looked at me and she said, Surah 43, verse 89, قُلْ سَلَامْ فَسَوْفَ يَعْلَمُونَ Say salam alaykum. He looked at her and he said, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Salam alaykum. Are you in need of guidance? She then said, Surah 39, verse number 37, 
Whoever Allah guides can never be misguided. He then looked at her and he said, Excuse me, are you a human or are you a genie? She looked at him, Surah 7, verse 31. Ya Bani Adam, Khudu Zinatukum and the Kulli Masjid. I'm a Bani Adam. He looked at him and he said, Okay, where have you come from? Surah 41, verse 44. min makanin ba'id. I've come from a far, far away place. He then said to her, Where are you going? She said, Surah 3, verse 97. Walillah ala nas hijjul bayt. Man istata'a alayhi sabila. I'm going towards Hajj. He said, so your kafila, how many days has it been lost? Surah 50, verse 38. خَلَقَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ فِي سِتَّةِ أَيَّامِ Six days. He said, very well. He looked at there and he said to her, but you must be hungry. She said, Surah 21, verse 8. وَمَا جَعَلْنَاهُمْ جَسَدًا لَا يَأْكُلُونَ الطَّعَامِ We did not create them as people who don't eat food. So he said to her, very well, very well. By the way, there's a camel over there. Run after it. It's going towards Hajj. She looked at him. Surah 2, verse 286. Allah does not put a burden on the soul unless it can handle it. I can't run that much. At this moment, what happens? The narration says that at this moment, he says, okay, very well. Then what we'll do is that I'll sit on the camel and you sit behind me. She says, Surah 21, verse 22, لو كان إلا الله لفسدتا. If there were gods other than Allah, there would be fasad. I can't sit behind you. You're not mahram to me. Then he looked at her and he said, very well. You ride the camel, I'll walk. Surah 43, verse 13, Subhanallah, سَخَّرَ لَنَا هَذَا وَمَا كُنَّا لَهُ مُقْرِنِينَ She's riding the camel, riding, then all of a sudden from far away, she see, they, he sees four people. He says, so who are those four? She says, Surah 18, verse 46, Al-Mal wal Banun. Zinat al-Hayat al-Dunya. So she looks at him and he says, okay, what's their names? She gives him the verse about Dawood, Inna ja'alnaka khalifa. She gives him the verse about Muhammad, Wa ma Muhammad illa rasul. She gives him the verse about Musa and the verse about Sulaiman. She gives him all these verses. He says, okay, now I know their names. Every verse about a name in the Quran. They come to her, they say, Mommy, how are you? Are you all right? Are you being looked after? She says, Surah 28, verse 26. Ya abati sta'jar, inna khayra man sta'jar tal qawi al ameen. Oh my father, give them rent because they are truthful and trustworthy. Give them their rent. The man looked at her and he said, Bibi Fadda, thank you for giving me the rent. She looked at him and she quoted the verse, Wallah yarzuqu man yasha. They asked her, how could you speak like this? And the reply that came from the man is, if you've been for 24 all your life under the University of Fatima al Zahra, do you think you won't speak with the Quran? Bibi Fadda only speaks with the Quran. And you found that that Bibi Fadda found it hard when she had to see Fatima lying on her bed with a broken rib. <laughs> And Bibi Fadda narrates, and Asma narrates, I saw Ali ibn Abi Talib give ghusl to Fatima to Zahra. Because the, grand, the daughter of Rasulullah, in defending the religion of Islam, they come and they push the door with the nail hitting her. And when the nail hits her, what happened? When the nail hits her, she miscarries the child. And when she miscarries that child, the narrations, what do they say to us? Say Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, those of you who've, been, who've ever given ghusl to your sister, to your wife, to your daughter, the ghusl is difficult. But imagine your Ali ibn Abi Talib, and this is the most beloved wife, the narration says, Asma says, Wallah, I saw Imam Ali go and sit in the corner of the ghusl room and cry. <laughs> Brothers, tonight is the night of Bibi Khadija. Your heart should be in Mecca. 
I said to him, O oh son of Abu Talib, why do you cry? You lifted the gates of Khaybar. He said to me, O oh Asma, I was just washing the body of my wife Fatima and my hand came across one of her broken ribs. <laughs> the narration goes further that when Imam Ali was carrying the body of Fatima, Imam Al Hassan ran to the chest of Fatima to Zahra. And he began to cry by her chest. He said, Mother, it's me, Hassan. Then Imam Al Hussein came on the chest of his mother. And he said to her, Mother, it is me, Hussein. Do you know what happened? There is a narration which says Jibra'il came. And he said, Oh Ali, remove Hussein from the chest of his mother. Why Jibra'il? Why remove Hussein? Because he said the angels cannot bear to see Hussein on the chest of his mother. I ask Jibra'il one question. Jibra'il, if the angels could not bear to see Hussein on the chest of Fatima, then how did the angels bear to see Shimmer on the chest of Hussein? <laughs> but wait, keep the tears, keep the tears. These tears will speak for us on the day of judgment. Oh lover of Fatima, where is the grave of Fatima? Where is the grave of Fatima? We go to Medina and we ask, where is Fatima? And on top of that, Imam Amir al muminin one day sees Imam al Hassan. Do you know how hard it was for these orphans? Imam Amir al sees Imam al Hassan one day, sees him crying and crying. He says to him, my son Hassan, what's wrong my son? Why do you cry? What's wrong? He says, my father, if you saw what I saw, you'll cry. Ali has not seen? He says to him, my father, if you saw what I saw, you'd cry. He says to him, what did you see? He says, my father, you know when my mother Fatima gave her khutbah Fadak? He said, yes. He said, my father, on her way back, two men came and slapped her. He said to him, what do you mean? He said to him, Wallah, they slapped my mother on her eye. Imam Ali looked at him, he said, now I know why your mother in her last days wouldn't look me in the eye. <laughs> and that's why Imam Ali, when he was by the grave of Fatima to Zahra, he was crying and crying. He fell asleep, unconscious at that moment. In his dream, he saw Fatima to Zahra saying to him, Ali, Ali. And that's why on a night like this, when we remember the mother of Fatima to Zahra, Khadija, we mention the Sha'ab of Abu Talib. And the Sha'ab of Abu Talib, the narrations mention that when Khadija died, Rasulullah wanted to come and bury her. All of us, when we come to bury someone, the first thing we do is we put a kafan on their body, don't we? A kafan. But because of how poor Rasulullah was, he couldn't afford a kafan for Khadija. He used his shroud, but his shroud wasn't long enough to cover her body. So Rasulullah felt sad at that moment. He raised his hands in dua. And he said, Ya Allah, I am your prophet. This is Khadija. If it wasn't for her wealth and the sword of Ali, if it wasn't for her wealth, Khadija would have no one. Khadija is the one who gave everything to Islam. But Ya Allah, I do not have a shroud, a kafan. Every human deserves to be buried with a kafan. Don't you agree? Isn't it sad if there is a day when a human lies on the ground without a kafan to cover his body? Isn't it sad if there is a human who lies on the ground and they trample on his kafan? Do you know what the narrations mention? When Rasulullah read that dua, Jibra'il came to him and he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, Allah heard your dua and he has bought five kafans which I have to give you. At this moment, Rasulullah looked at him and he said, Ya Jibra'il, tell me who the first kafan is for. He said to him, Ya Rasulullah, the first kafan is for Khadija.
in order that you are able to bury her, you are able to cover her. He said to him, Jibra'il, tell me who the second kafan is for. He said to him, Ya Rasulallah, the second kafan is for you. That when you die, there is a kafan to cover your body. He said to him, Jibra'il, tell me who's the third kafan for. He said, the third kafan is for Fatima to Zahra. That when she dies, there is a kafan to cover her body. He said to him, Jibra'il, tell me who the fourth kafan is for. He said to him, the fourth kafan is for Ali ibn Abi Talib. That when he dies, there is a kafan to cover his body. He said to him, Jibra'il, tell me who the fifth kafan is for. He said to him, the fifth kafan is for your grandson Imam al-Hasan. That when he dies, there is a kafan to cover his body. You know the next slide. He said to him, Jibra'il, tell me where is the kafan for Abu Abdullah? Will Abu Abdullah die with a kafan to cover his body? He said to him, Ya Rasulullah, Abu Abdullah will die without a kafan on his body. Raise your hands on this blessed night. Raise your hands, brothers and sisters. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Muhammad and Ali.